What's going on, Game Dad fam? I'm an Orion. You can call me the Game Dad, and today we're going to be looking at a game I've been very excited to talk about called Empire of Sin. Now, to disclose, I did reach out to Paradox Interactive and was provided a code of the game, so this is a sponsored review, but I received nothing other than the premium edition of the game, and all views are my own. Also, the code received was for the Xbox One version of the game, so all footage and commentary will reflect that version. And with that, guys and gals and non-binary pals, let's take a little trip back in time. That, uh, that, that, that voice will make more sense in a minute. What's that I hear? A free lunch? Get to the part where you ask me for something. Empire of Sin is a new game in the burgeoning tactical squad combat genre, but with a lot more to it, and is the latest product from publisher Paradox Interactive and developer Romero Games. Paradox has been known for some excellent tactical combat simulations, including Stellaris, Europa Universalis 4, and Crusader Kings 3, so this was right up their alley. As for Romero Games, yes, it was founded by that Romero as in John Romero, the father of Doom, as well as his wife, Brenda Romero. The game itself is set in the 1920s Prohibition era in Chicago, I told you that voice would make more sense, and the basic premise is simple. Pick one of 13 different real-life mob bosses to lead your criminal enterprise, build an empire, become the king or queen of crime. To accomplish that, the game has three key pillars. Tactical combat in the vein of XCOM, financial simulation and business management in the vein of something like, say, SimCity, and some interactions and diplomacy with branching discussion options to broker peace or work with other gangs in the vein of something like Civilization. Now, to begin a game, you first choose your mobster of choice between the 13 different, as I said, real-life gang bosses, such as Al Capone of the Chicago Outfit, Daniel McKee Jackson of the Vice Kings, and Elvira Duarte, aka Crime Grandma of Los Luceros. You can guess who I started with. And then go through deciding on the game difficulty, of which there are five levels, as well as the effective length of the game in the form of how many neighborhoods there are and how many total gangs there are within them. You can have anywhere from 3 to 10 neighborhoods and from 6 to 13 games, so the games can vary wildly in length based on what you choose, and it lets you start in the kiddie pool before going in the deep end, so to speak. Now, as far as the main stuff, let's talk about combat, because, quite frankly, that's likely to be the first thing to draw someone in. While it's rooted in the XCOM formula, it takes its own liberties. The base idea is moving on a segmented map, focusing on finding cover, and firing at enemies with percentage-based accuracy. All that's there. But alongside that are unique actions each individual character can take, based on the guns they have equipped, the talents you've had them learn, and more. A shotgun, for instance, can be used to fire a spread of damage over an area, but a machine gun can't. But a character may have the spread shot ability so that they could use it in the same way. Your main mobster has a unique talent no matter which one you choose, and a bunch of different, more learnable unique talents along the way, and there are a host of other gangsters you can hire for varying costs that each have their own class to determine what they can do in combat, and have a semi-unique loadout. As well as talents, there are traits, which have bonuses or penalties to both combat and the financial aspect of things, and which can be innate or develop over time, kind of like roguelikes such as Darkest Dungeon or Rogue Legacy. This means that nearly every character feels relevant and unique, even if they aren't necessarily the best. For instance, in the early game you're likely to come across gangster Maria Rodriguez, who has limited HP and will probably have some combat issues later because of it, but early on she has a unique trait that puts her in Overwatch to begin every combat, which means if she's anywhere near the enemy units to begin the match, she'll shoot the first enemy that moves anywhere she can see. Give her a powerful machine gun, and she'll basically start every fight by mowing down an enemy before they can do anything, which makes her useful far longer than her stats might imply. The flip side is a character might, say, become a coward if their health drops too low too often, which will have them running from combat beyond your control. The good thing is having so many gangsters available means you really can't get screwed by this, so you get to just enjoy the relative uniqueness of it. At least as big and involved as the combat is the simulation and empire management part of the game. Acquiring rackets is the name of the game, and there are six different ones. The safe house, of which you have one, and it functions as an HQ of sorts for meetings, as well as produces a baseline amount of alcohol for your other businesses to sell. 
breweries, which are your main alcohol producers, speakeasies, brothels, and casinos, which are all where you actually make your money and have a few differences between them, and hotels, which increase how many people are in a location to patronize your businesses. You start the game with a safe house, a speakeasy, and a brewery, and there are three ways to get more rackets. You can buy an existing building and make it something, take over a derelict building and beat up the random thugs inside and make it something, or take over an enemy gang's racket, and once you have it, either keep it the same or, you guessed it, make it something. Once you have these rackets, each one has multiple categories to them that you can upgrade, such as security to have more guards posted, production for your breweries, word of mouth to have more people attend your rackets, and more. To get even more granular, there are actually five different types of alcohol you can produce, of different qualities, and you can have each of your breweries producing different kinds of alcohol, and each of your fronts selling different kinds based on the preferences of the locals. Look, it sounds complicated, but once you get into it, honestly, it's not that bad and everything tends to flow together pretty well. The last leg of things to discuss is the discussions, and at this point I should bring up the questing. The most common use of it is in sit-down conversations with other gang bosses, where you can choose to be antagonistic or friendly, but still with a hint of snark. I wasn't busy Irish. I might be later, depending on what happens in this conversation. Options will determine how the conversation goes, with you able to form packs with other bosses to get, say, discounts to upgrades or bonuses to your output, as well as the ability to just straight pull a gun on them and declare war, cause why not? Crime Gamma don't play that. There are also quests that can be done that will vary from game to game, such as poisoning a mob boss's alcohol supply for a shady organization, or helping one of your gangsters deal with a date while he has a drinking problem as well as unique quest lines for each of the different mob bosses themselves. They all tend to be really fun and interesting to go through, and absolutely worth your time. Fine. I'll take care of it. Thanks, Mr. Capone. Say, looks like we're almost there. It's been a pleasure. Good luck to you. One other thing I want to draw attention to is the fact that each of the playable bosses feels really unique from each other, while all still feeling really powerful and consistently useful. Crime Grandma has a move that can straight up take over an enemy and have them join your side for the remainder of the fight, where Danny McKee Jackson has a skill that lets him just keep firing his gun till he's out of bullets, and if he kills an enemy he's shooting, he just moves on to the next one, and he actually gets a cooldown bonus for everyone he takes out. They all feel relatively cool and different from each other, making for a lot more replayability to go with how many different gangsters there are to try and recruit. On an accessibility front, the game does have a few worthwhile options, such as multiple audio and visual languages, adjustable subtitles including size, and a colorblind filter, though there's only one colorblind filter option as opposed to ones for specific color leanings, so it's a one-size-fits-all situation. There is no button remapping, which is something they could certainly add, but I need to point out the sound options. All of them are adjustable on a scale up to 11. John Romero game. Of course it goes to 11. So after all that, I gotta start talking about the not so good stuff. This game has, um, issues, to say the least. To begin with, let's talk about the glitches. Sometimes it's stuff like accepting a sit-down with a rival gang boss and the game just decides it doesn't want to let you keep moving the cursor until you reload the save. Sometimes it's stuff like Al Capone getting stuck in a gunfire animation and staying that way for several minutes until I have him specifically shoot again. Whatever it is, every so often things just glitch and get unstable. It's not the worst I've seen, we're not talking Assassin's Creed Unity at launch here but it has to be addressed. On the plus side though, I do have to be honest. The devs have been taking in all the bug reports they've gotten and have been churning out patches for all the platforms, so they are trying to improve the experience. That said, there are other issues. I think the voices of the characters themselves are great across the board. Every voice feels right to the character, but the performances can be hit and miss. There were times where lines were delivered and I, I, I genuinely feel like it just, it had to be the first read of the line. Like, take this one for example. Yeah, you might be jumping a gun, mustache. I'm just keeping myself occupied. This is nonsense. 
I expected straight talk from Alphonse Capone. I have killed a lot of people and lost a few. To be sitting here talking to you, don't disappoint me. Y you see what I mean? Th there's some genuinely good deliveries, but there's also not so good. So it's just, it's hit and miss. There's also balancing issues, of which there are several, to be honest. Remember how I brought up shotguns can blast over an area? Well, it's a good thing I did, because you'll probably forget they exist later in the game, because even common rifles outdo the damage of legendary shotguns for one-on-one -on -one combat, and a lot of characters can figure out how to do damage to multiple enemies. So you're likely to just use rifles, sniper rifles, and machine guns. Even outside of combat, building up rackets can be time-consuming, for little gain, while quests can make you thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars very quickly. The rackets matter for the long term of the game, but when presented with work on your rackets or do a quest, it's pretty much always going to be focus on the quest exclusively. On anything but the lowest difficulties, businesses just lack the profit for a long while to motivate you to focus on them. You mostly just focus on them to getting you to not lose money, then upgrade them as you have spare spending cash and tell you do more quests. Then there's questionable choices like having only three main files, which you can have as many saves within as you like. Sure, only so many people want to have four or more games going, but it's still odd. And then there's stuff like how you can name any racket when you first obtain it, and you can rename any gangster you hire. And you can rename any gangster whenever you like, but you can't rename rackets after you first get them. Again, it's it's not major. It's just, it's questionable and it's worth mentioning. It's part of the list. So that's why I get to the end of this review conflicted because I'm having a hard time summing up my thoughts into a single idea. Because to begin with, tactical shooters and sim games are not the most widely appealing genres. So I'm already talking to a subset of gaming as it is. And there's just a number of problems with this game, like the stability and the balancing. But I just can't stop playing. Like, trust me, I had no shortage of footage for this review. It's so genuinely fun. I've spent hours in different files, messed around with different strategies, and for all the things that frustrate me. When the game hits its stride, it really hits it. And that's my issue. The game is a diamond inside a lump of coal. It is surrounded by problems and issues, especially when you're counting the fact that it's a $40 plus game, depending on the version you get. But when it shines, it shines bright. The characters are fun, the music gets you in the mood, some of the interactions are genuinely excellent, and the gameplay can get really fun in combat situations. Then your gangster gets stuck in some weird position or a crew member refuses to move for like three minutes and you get reminded of all the issues. So knowing how much they're working on it, what score can I really give it? Well, I'm cheating. I'm giving you two. Empire of Sin gets a seven out of 10, going to a 7.5 once the stability is truly improved. The balancing isn't perfect, but I think if the game itself gets fully stable, this is an absolute gem and one of the really good experiences of 2020. Its bright spots are absolutely worth rolling the dice on. And uh, <clears throat> speaking of rolling the dice, I need to go check on one of my completely legitimate businesses. That's how you own this city. Go get him, Kingpin. I'll see you around. Hey, thanks so much for watching the review. I really appreciate your time. If you like what you saw, maybe do all that cool engagement stuff YouTube likes, you know? Hit the like button, comment below, subscribe for more, ring the bell to get notified, all that jazz. Also, if you enjoyed this review, feel free to check out my review on Immortals Phoenix Rising. My name's Norian. you can call me the Game Dad. Until next time, I'll catch you later, Game Dad fam. <laughs>